Good afternoon. This oral history interview of Kath Kathleen Gilligan Sebelius, formerly a member of this body, the House of Representatives, formerly Insurance Commissioner of Kansas and Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services under President Obama, is being conducted under the sponsorship of the Kansas Oral History Project, a nonprofit corporation created for the purpose of establishing an archive of oral histories of Kansans who served in policy-making roles. Our collection, Kansas Governors, will interview former governors who also served in the legislature or held other elective office. These interviews focus on their legislative activity and provide insights on how these legislators developed their political and policy skills. This interview will also explore how that legislative experience shaped your public policy priorities as governor and secretary of HHS. I'm Joan Wagner, former legislator and secretary of revenue, and I will be conducting this interview along with my colleague, Dwayne Gosen, who was former legislator. In fact, we all served at exactly the same time. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, Dwayne was also budget director and Secretary of Administration under Kathleen. Yes. Both of us served with you, Kathleen, in the legislature and joined your cabinet in 2003 when you were elected governor. Yes, and that you was did. quite a crowd yeah. you had. Yeah. Our videographer today is David Heineman, who was uh, also in the legislature with us, and a speaker pro tem. We all serve, Dwayne, David, and I, on the Kansas Oral History Project Board of Directors. Governor, Secretary, <laughs> Kathleen, friend, uh -huh. uh, would you start off by just giving us your background? You had an interesting political family when you grew up. Well, I was uh, born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, my dad, John, better known as Jack Gilligan, ran for office for the first time when I was five. And so I really grew up thinking that's what families did in the fall. They went door to door, they put up yard signs. Sure. Nobody ever told me it was a volunteer activity. So I, you know, he won some elections, he lost some elections, but he served as a member of city council, he served as a member of Congress, and he ultimately was governor of Ohio. And that really taught me a lot about politics on the ground, about elections, about parties. He really built the Democratic Party in Cincinnati. There wasn't a Democratic Party in Cincinnati when um, he started to run. Um, my father-in-law, my mother's father, was also in politics. He was probably very successful and could have been enormously successful, but my grandmother hated it, so he <laughs> dropped out early on. And then I ended up marrying a Kansas native whose father was in politics on the other side of the aisle, but um, who had served in the state Senate and then served as a member of Congress. He was in Congress when we got married. So I actually had politics all around me. To say that it was in your genes is not an <laughs> understatement. It's probably true. Uh, when you arrived in this chamber in 1986, 87. I was elected in 86, came in 87. What had you been doing just prior to that? Well, for eight years prior to running for the House, I had been the executive director of the Kansas Trial Lawyers Association. So I'd spent a lot of time in the Capitol. I lobbied for the trial lawyers, gave testimony, you know, watched issues on their behalf. So I was pretty familiar with both the House and the Senate, the, the governor's office. Um, and uh, when I came here, it, it felt like, um, you know, I finally actually got to make my own votes and not just try to twist somebody else's <laughs> arm to uh, cast a vote yeah. on an issue I believe in. So, um, is there anything else about your background that we ought to probe? It's pretty well known. People, I started doing a, a Google search and there are any number of articles on you in the New York Times and <laughs> just about everywhere. So that part of your, your uh, background is pretty well known. I think what we want to do now, well, unless I you would, have something else. I would add something. Go ahead. Um, because I think a lot of people assume, you know, when they look at what I did and then 
in politics and, and kind of the steps beyond the House of Representatives that I ran for the House in order to be governor, that I ran for the House, you know, to build that political resume. I actually ran for the House to go home. Um, <laughs> my kids were two and five. I lived here in Topeka, the capital city. Uh, my husband was a busy trial lawyer. And I would say the wheels were kind of coming off the wagon. Uh, the kids were, I was working for the trial lawyers 40, 50, sometimes 60 hours a week. I was traveling nationally a bunch uh, at their meetings. And when the seat in my neighborhood came open, I had worked on Judy Reynolds' campaign. She was my predecessor. I knew the drill, but it also was a part-time job. I was in a very full-time, high-pressure job. and. The legislature met four months a year, and then you could pick and choose interim committees. And for me, with young kids and a busy husband, it seemed like a great step to actually have a better work-family balance. And that's really why I ran. Um, and I, I think that gets lost somehow in the shuffle along the way. I'm sure it does, but it also seemed like there was a, a, a pot when, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what's the, the word? It, a cabal. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, an expectation. It was, it was uh, Ruth, Wilkin. Ruth Wilkin and Judy Ronalds right. and you and right. then Marge Petty and right. uh, Potwin just had a seat in the in the Kansas House. And, That's right. Yeah. Except Marge ran for the Senate. Yeah. Well, it's still a seat. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, why don't we shift gears for a minute and uh, let you ask Kathleen a few questions about how she saw the culture of the legislature. Yeah. As your career actually played out, uh, you experienced and knew the legislature from multiple, multiple different angles, uh, as a lobbyist, uh, then as a sitting legislator, uh, as insurance commissioner, and then, of course, as governor. And so, I mean, that, that's a lot of different angles and different ways of interacting uh, with the legislature. Um, Reflect on that a little bit. How, how did you experience the legislature at each of those stages, and um, how, had, how did it change along the way? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I, um, I would say in those early days, so I was, uh, if I ran for the House in 86, 16 is eight, it was about 78, 78 to 86 that I was um, working with the trial lawyers and in and out of this chamber in that yeah. regard. First, there were a bunch of lawyers here on yeah. both sides of the aisle. There were right. Republican lawyers, and often law firms felt that it was their civic responsibility to send a young member of their firm to serve for mm -hmm. years. That was a pretty common trait that the big firms would have a member who served and then when he or she decided not to serve any longer, somebody else would step up and serve. So there were bunches of lawyers and in those days I was really looking for people who were interested in legal issues and um, when I got to the House, the House and the Senate were pretty evenly divided. It, it was um, a much closer mix of legislators which meant Counting votes was important, but also making coalitions was important. Um, you could not pass things without, you know, finding some folks across the aisle, but pretty evenly balanced, pretty um, lots of moderate Republicans who were interested in school finance and health care and other issues, some conservative Democrats who were not so interested in some of those issues, some conservative Republicans. So you would issue by issue be able to put together a coalition. And then, you know, one one time, two years in the House, I in my four terms, I actually served in the majority. And that was a whole different experience of finally chairing the committees and, you know, kind of helping to run the show and shape um, the policy. Uh, but I'd say around 1996, and I say 96 because we suddenly had two open U.S. Senate seats in Kansas. Uh, Bob Dole left the Senate to run for president and Nancy Kassebaum had announced she wasn't going to run again. Bill Graves appointed the, you know, um, sitting Republican governor, appointed his lieutenant governor and suddenly there was a fissure in the Republican Party. 
yeah. where, you know, first term Congressman Sam Brownback stepped up and said, I will take on Sheila Fromm, sitting senator, I will run a primary. And you had the chairman of the Republican Party sort of declare war on the sitting Republican governor. And the Republican Party began to really divide. Um, one of the first people to endorse Sam uh, Brownback for Senate was a legislator named Phil Klein, who <laughs> ended up running for attorney general and serving as my first term attorney general, which was frankly fairly terrifying um, because he and I did not share much in terms of issues or have the same view of the law. Um, so I, I watched this split that not only was occurring in the Republican Party, but began to show up in the legislature where, um, frankly, the moderate Republicans were more disliked by conservative Republicans than were Democrats. We, we kind of, it wasn't we got a free pass, but um, often the battle was so ferocious internally and more and more moderate Republicans began losing in primary challenges and mm -hmm. to the point that, you know, it, it hadn't tilted as far certainly as it has today. But by the time I was governor, the legislative makeup began to look very different and feel very different. There were really two Republican parties by that point. The Democrats, you know, still had a range of people from Johnson County to Southeast Kansas to central Kansas not sharing a lot of the same views on issues, but could be put together as a reliable block. But the Republicans were splintered all over the place. And that really was a very dramatic change, I think, in than what I experienced. When I came to Kansas, um, Bob Bennett, who was a sitting state senator, yeah. had just been elected governor, it was 19... I got married in December of 1974, came here in January of 75. So Bob Bennett was a newly elected Republican governor, and he was talking about mental health reform and more money in education. Bob Docking, who had just departed as the Democratic governor, was talking about fiscal austerity and mm -hmm. adequate but austere budgets. And I really thought I had lost my mind because if I close my eyes, Bob Bennett, to me, sounded like an Ohio Democrat, and Bob Docking sounded like an Ohio Republican. So I was very confused about the political terrain I was stepping into. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in your early years as a, as a lobbyist, um, you, were, you were then working, though, with both, really both parties. Yeah. And did it? How did that serve you then as you uh, went into the legislature? Well, I think one of the things I learned to do early on was count votes. Yeah. And it didn't really matter where the votes came from. It was who, who is possibly gettable, if you will, getting a bill out of committee, passing a bill on the floor. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I learned quickly that there were very reliable trial lawyer votes on the Republican side of the aisle and very reliable trial lawyer votes on the Democratic side of the aisle, and then very unreliable. So to try and figure out who was who, and you know, my goal in those days, and continued on certainly as a legislator, was to get to 63 in the House and 21 in the Senate. And I think that experience was helpful, because it, what I learned quickly is you know, it, it wasn't about really party, it was really issue by issue. Yeah. Um, some issues brought together one coalition of folks uh, from both sides of the aisle. And another issue, uh, you know, a social issue may divide those folks, but put together a different group. Um, but the goal being to, you know, kind of move the ball down the field and figure out who, who was available. There were, um, when I first got to the legislature, when I, things I identified very quickly is that Bob Miller, who was a... Wellington Republican, and he and I served on the Fed and State Committee together. He had um, young children, and he was interested in some of the same early childhood issues and some of the same um, issues around kids' health that I was interested mm -hmm. in. And my deal with him was 
I'll, I'll bring you ideas. You take the lead on the bill. I can be second. And he would say, no, it's your idea. You should be. I said, no, no, no. I'm a Democrat. They won't let me have a bill that gets out of committee, but you can do this. And so we formed a very early coalition around some issues. I didn't necessarily agree with Robert on, you know, 100% of the issues, probably not even 60% of the issues, but on those issues, uh, we were totally in sync. So learning how to figure out where people came from, what they were interested in, what their priorities were, and how that could maybe match uh, was a really important lesson that you know I learned at every step along the way. Did that still seem to work the same way when the Democrats were in the majority uh, in the House? Did did uh, did uh, was there still pretty uh, interesting cross communication between Democrats, moderates, uh, other Republicans? Yeah, there really had to be um, because yeah. we had 63 votes. We were at the bare. Yeah. I mean, to call it a majority, <laughs> it's you know, it's like the 50-50 Senate split right now that we watch in the United States Senate. I mean, you could not lose a single Democrat. So. We never relied on 100% Democratic votes. Um, you really needed kind of a coalition of people because uh, a lot of the issues, again, divided people on geography, on background and interest, on pro-business versus pro-labor. I mean, you know, yeah. there were all kinds of reasons that people would split. So you always had to be able to put together that 63, it was never about, if you're in the party, you vote this way. Um, the Democratic caucus was, as Joan knows well, um, hardly a monolith. <laughs> and yeah. So, you know, it always took some folks. I think um, it also was an era when I served in the legislature, and this continued on, I think, while I was governor, that it wasn't treason to compromise. It wasn't seen as being a traitor to your uh, party nomination to actually form a coalition. It was seen as, as pretty positive um, and in many ways. And both to um, stop things, uh, you know, I was part of a group who stopped my Cadence Highway Bill, and that was a very curious coalition of most Democrats. We lost a few who were very interested in highways, but then this very conservative group of Republicans who really, right. you know, wanted to stop the bill for different reasons. But uh, so coalitions were often odd bedfellows, I would say. Yeah. The rebels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then as you continued on as an insurance commissioner, um, did you spend much time with the legislature in, in that role? Or did you watch more from a distance? Or how, how did... How did you interact then? I had some interaction with the legislature, but far less, yeah. and um, tried to have as little as possible, frankly, uh, because the office had pretty broad jurisdiction, and my goal was to kind of stay out of the legislature and use the administrative powers. I'd never um, run an agency. I'd never really worked in a state agency, and it was an enormous um, learning experience to try and get up to speed on regulating this multi-billion dollar industry. Um, but we certainly dealt with the insurance committee a lot and there mm -hmm. were bills and issues that affected, I got very involved in particularly health insurance issues and in some cases um, some of the issues involving property and casualty insurance because the companies would threaten to pull out after a tornado and leave people hanging. So consumer protection issues and health insurance were the two areas that I continue to have a lot of legislative involvement. And did any of that stuff seem partisan at the time? Did it, uh, or did it play out in more of a uh, issue coalition kind of way with the legislature? I would say the insurance industry was pretty damn partisan. <laughs> um, it, you know, the, <laughs> the companies were big players and yeah. um, you know, in, in many ways, I think, tilted uh, against consumers. And um, the insurance commissioner's office, that regulatory agency, had been basically controlled by the companies for a long period of time and had never, um, you know, they made healthy contributions to the sitting commissioner, helped to write a lot of the rules and regs. And, 
what I found uh, when I got there was that Kansas was really tilted very much on an industry side of the house, and so we we tried to retilt it. We the good news it was I did not need legislative permission to do that yeah. because I'm not sure I could have gotten the legislative permission to do that. A number of the bills that I would take to the legislature as some of them just symbolic. I, I didn't have a lot of hope they would pass, but I thought at least it gave me an opportunity to say we should be doing these kinds of things. You know, we should mm -hmm. be providing more help in health insurance. We should be looking out for consumers more, preventing people from dropping coverage, that kind of thing. I wasn't terribly hopeful that the legislature would, would pass the bill, but at least it gave me a chance to talk about an issue, and then we could move as far as we could administratively. You then came out of those experiences as insurance commissioner and ran for governor. I did. And <laughs> at, at the time you were running and campaigning, um, Kansas, were really all states, were in a recession and having pretty significant budget problems. Uh, the legislature in the session before uh, you were elected uh, raised taxes. Then Governor Graves, uh, after that legislative session, used his allotment authority a couple of times to cut back on, on spending that had been approved. Uh, all while this campaign was going <laughs> along, uh, did, did that financial situation that the state was in, did that affect your campaign? Did it, uh, it how, did, how, how did you think about it at the time? <laughs> did, you, did you hope that it would just be gone or? Uh... Well, absolutely, I hoped <laughs> it would be gone. Um, I mean, it was fairly terrifying because yeah. we had looming in the horizon um, a major school finance lawsuit that right. had not been, that had really been put on hold during the Graves administration by the lawyers who decided not to bring it forward while um, there was a Republican governor, but it was there and ready to be acted on. So a lot more money was going to be required to meet constitutional muster. On the other hand, um, I, you know, I was advised by a lot of uh, campaign uh, operatives that do not talk about raising taxes, do not, um, because that would be the death knell. You'll never get to be governor if you do that. So the balance of trying to be as honest with Kansans as possible, the one commitment that I felt comfortable making is I would never cut schools. I would never cut funding for schools in spite of the turmoil. And I, it was a logical place to go for money because it had, you know, the, um, bulk of the budget, okay. but right. to make that commitment. And my opponent, who had also served in the House with us, Tim Schallenberger, who was actually my seatmate for <laughs> my first term in office. I was at the so-called DMZ line where um, a Democrat <laughs> had to sit next to a Republican. We were that closely divided. And I found out later that the leadership decided I could be that person because nobody was going to talk me into voting for anything I didn't want to vote for. They, they didn't want anybody to be compromised by the Republicans, so they said, you can do that. And Tim and I actually got to be pretty good friends, um, but Tim made uh, a statement at some point during the campaign that he would cut, that on the table would be everything. He was, uh, the follow-up question was, including schools, he said yes. And at that point, it was like, okay, that is an issue that um, may be the defining issue to, to get me to the governor's office. God knows what I will do when I get there <laughs> with you know, $12.50 in somebody's um, bank account, but it, that became a critical issue. But yeah, I was terrified by that downturn. Well, when you actually did get there, <laughs> uh, despite uh, the tax increases and the revenue that that raised and despite uh, the, uh, Bill Graves' allotment cuts, uh, the state was still in a super rough situation, and I think it was widely assumed at the time that uh, you were going to have to raise taxes and cut spending uh, probably pretty significantly uh, in your first budget, at least, or to make things balance. Um, so no governor <laughs> wants to be in such a position, especially in the, in the very first time that right. they... Uh, encounter putting a budget together. 
how did all of that seem to you? And you came in with your pledge on school finance, which uh, I mean, schools, school funding is half the general fund budget. It's, it's pretty hard to protect that in a situation that the kind of situation you were facing at the time. Well, one of the things I was fortunate to do was talk some really good people into serving in the cabinet. Um, Joan Wagnon took the job as uh, the um, Secretary of Revenue, yeah. so in charge of finding every dime <laughs> that was out there and figuring out ways to actually bring in more money with the framework that we had. The brilliant Dwayne Gosen, uh, talking to me right now, knew more about the budget than I will ever know. And so I, I felt some confidence in at least having very capable, skilled people to look at the situation. And, you know, we started um, by having a very um, transparent, bipartisan, public-private process to look for ways to cut spending and mm -hmm. look for budget adjustments that we could make. Because it, it seemed like um, one of the things that was really needed was an education of the public. How bad things really are, where the money is, where it's being spent, let the public get a real view into what the budget looks like. There were all kinds of people who said, oh, you know, I could do this. And people from industry who were particularly <laughs> proud of their business acumen, you know, no problem at all. Well, we can figure this out. So I said, fine, come on. And we had a process, a couple month process that began immediately after I was elected, had hearings around the state, had looks at transportation, at education, at the major areas, incarceration, um, you know, areas that spent a lot of money and said, we're open to all ideas, you know, bring them forward. Right. And did you know you were going to do that? Uh, I mean, that that process started immediately after your election. You had you had to put a budget together uh, before you actually took the oath of office as governor. And right. uh, you started those teams uh, very, very quickly. By about Labor Day, in hopes, you know, it was always optimistic that, yes, I, I think I can win this thing. We began to put that framework together yeah. and really find some models in other states and some people who came out of other states who had done this before. Mm -hmm. um, so we weren't kind of inventing it. I worked very closely with outgoing Governor Graves, who was totally spectacular as a um, departing um, governor to work with me on, because he put forward the first budget, and I got to sort of amend it, but it was really his framework budget. And the allotments that you're referring to, the cuts that he made, um, were cuts that he came to me with and said, why don't I do these now and um, kind of save you at least this chapter of pain? And we worked together on, don't cut so much here, how about there? But he took those on himself, which was really a great gift uh, coming into an office. So I didn't, as you say, had to start with, you know, slashing funds away. And then we, um, came up with kind of an interesting scheme, which was, it wasn't a scheme, it was a framework. <laughs> uh, the, the legislature, or the, the law says that the governor has to submit a balanced budget. And um, the notion was that I couldn't, at this point the legislature was less balanced than it was when I served in the legislature. There were more Republicans and fewer Democrats. And I knew that what I could not do is get Republicans to spend money in areas that I wanted to spend it. So um, working with the uh, budget director, um, we spent every dime. I put together a budget that spent 100% of every dime we could find. And then we had a little proviso that went into the budget that said, um, if the legislature wants to cut funding to comply with the Balanced Budget Act or whatever the official title was, we gave them a percentage that you cut across the board, knowing that no one would ever do that. Um, but the last thing I wanted to do was to give a roadmap of how to cut money out of programs that I felt were really important. And hoping that that expanded spending would get us to the point where the legislature, I mean, the economy would begin to 
um, tick upward, and and Joan by that point would have found lots of nickels and dimes sales and couch tax. streamlined yes. sales tax, <laughs> collecting more revenue, auditing people, yeah, we going after stuff, and that we'd find some real savings in the process. So the combination, the hope was that the combination would get us to the point where the economy was beginning to to look better. And how did that work uh, in your? As you look back on it, how did that work with the legislature, both with Republicans and Democrats? You had to sell it to both of them. Uh, it did. I, mean, I, I think there was initial <laughs> shock by Republicans and, and some charge that you weren't complying with the law, you weren't doing this, you, you need to cut the budget. You need. I mean, I think they were furious that um, I'd found a way to actually present a budget and that they, if they wanted to reduce resources, they had to do the cutting. And they had to start in committees cutting very popular programs. So um, it was a flip of the scenario that they were hoping they would come into. Right. And um, there were no tax increases. There proposed. were no tax increases that were proposed. There were some additional revenue found in various ways, yeah. but no tax increases in the budget. So the initial response was furor. At the end of the day, they passed the budget absolutely as presented to them which was frankly shocking to me, um, but it, it worked. They thought they were going to trap you. I, I, it seemed like the logic, and you know, every indication pointed that it was a trap. I mean, you're walking into a place promising not to raise taxes with a school finance plan, with this, with that, and um, we ended up figuring out a way to get through that first session, and indeed the economy, thank God, began to... Uh, tick up and it, it began to fill the coffers and then the, the lawsuit became activated. <laughs> <laughs> right. Things did get much, much, much better financially after that. And uh, uh, I mean, the, the issues changed, but uh, really your governorship was in a way bookended by recessions because you had <laughs> one coming in. And then towards the end of your uh, administration, what has been called the Great, the Great Recession, Recession, was really just getting started in, right. in Kansas. Um, seemed like a good time for me to leave. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, those kinds of financial pressures, I mean, they had to have uh, influenced you in, in, in your strategy and in the, the kinds of policies and issues that you were uh, willing to take on. Well, they did in a way, but I had the luxury of at least the time that I was here. We had um, pretty substantial revenues, and we had an opportunity to pick and choose. And, you know, I, I bet on the fact that even though the Republicans uh, that I served with talked a good game about cutting budgets, they really didn't want to cut budgets. Yeah. They really didn't want to cut programs. They wanted somebody else to do it. They would vote for it. But absent me doing it, they were not about to cut money out of budgets or health care or, you know, prison care or all the major components. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that's true today, but it was true then that the programs that basically comprise a state budget, which are, you know, as one of my friends used to say, served as governor with me, uh, we incarcerate uh, we medicate and we um, educate, and those are the big chunks of. St and he said the rest is chump change. But you know, that's really what state budgets comply. And if you look at it, it's really true, um, that's true that that's where you had to get the money, and they were not about to cut um, those programs. So, you know, I kind of bet on that. I watched it. How, you know, it was a bit of a staring contest. Um, Dwayne, you remember as budget director when I first <laughs> kind of proposed and said, you said, well, how are we going to get to this point? I said, well, can't we just write a paragraph that says, <laughs> you know, you want to cut? Here's how you cut and just give them a percentage. You said, actually, that could work. <laughs> 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 and it was like, okay, well, then let's do it. <laughs> and literally, we spent every dime, every stream. I mean, we didn't steal money out of other programs, which is done in later administrations, but we really spent every time that we had. It was like, there were limited amounts available. Yeah, but, uh, but, but everything, everything, it was gone. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about schools. Yeah. Okay. Because the Montoy uh, decision 
came while you were in office, and it, it was the first uh, real challenge to the bill that we worked on in 1994. In 1994, we sat over there in that speaker's office, right. and uh, probably 20 of us all talking about how do we craft a school finance bill that's going to be constitutional and will still do what we want it to do. And we argued and fought, and uh, we went back and forth, and we passed it. So by 2004 and five, when the lawsuit is progressing, they hadn't funded it. Right. That, right. I mean, they just didn't put the money into it. So it was the first real challenge of that 94. T talk to me a little bit about how you call that special session in 2005 and how that worked. Well, that was, um, so Judge Bullock local Topeka judge ruled that the yeah. school finance plan was at that point unconstitutional because it was not providing fair and adequate funding. Um, and that case began to work its way through. Uh, Phil Klein, a former legislative colleague, was the sitting attorney general. And he began to get very actively involved in the process meeting with the Republican caucus, giving them what I thought was really bad legal advice, saying you don't, first of all, you don't have to pay any attention to the court, you don't have to pay attention to the parameters that they've given, pay no attention to the, um, you know, we can just proceed on this, and frankly declared himself to be the state. He would be the state. Um, so step one was really to fire him as my attorney. Um, I had a very tense meeting with him and said I was going to hire an outside counsel to represent the governor's office, that I actually was the state, he was not, um, and that I would tell the court that he should not have standing to come into the courtroom because he was representing nobody at that time. He could meet with the caucus all he wanted, but he was not representing the state of Kansas. Um, and so I did that. Um, in spite of that activity, there was a bill passed by the Republicans um, that I felt would in no way, shape, or form satisfy the court um, issues. And again, Attorney General Klein advised the Republicans it was just fine. So what I decided was that um, I wouldn't veto the bill and put myself in the middle of this contest. I'd just expedite a, a bill, as you both know, can become law without a signature that I would just let it become law and send it immediately and ask for an expedited hearing at the Kansas Supreme Court. Yeah. And so it was not about me versus the legislature. It was the legislature going to the court with their brilliant proposal. And, um, and indeed, the court said fairly quickly, absolutely not. This does not work. It doesn't meet the qualifications here, are the parameters here. And at that point, um, I think in a you know, and an unhappy opinion said basically, um, we are not sure we will allow schools to even open in September. That was the ultimate cudgel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but this bill, until they're adequately funding, we're not going to continue to allow this unconstitutional situation to continue. So we had the grounds to then call the legislature back. Um, and again, knowing that a tour around the state was not a bad idea. Um, I had done it um, when I was insurance commissioner and had to make a ruling on Blue Cross Blue Shield that. and yeah. whether they should, went around the state. I did it as I came in as governor on the cuts that we would invite people to the SMART program that we would invite. I went. It wasn't called the SMART program. I can't even remember. Do you remember what the task force was called? The FAT. We had an acronym for the budget cutting process. That um, best teams. Best teams. Thank you. Um, but again, that had hearings around the state. So this preceding the call for the legislature did sort of hearings and town halls and things mm -hmm. around the state to talk about what we had to do for school funding, knowing that it was, um, I mean, I think school funding is the most personal issue. It also is an issue that's important everywhere. And everybody knew if you mm -hmm. close a school, you close a town. 
that it was, uh, you know, important to balance rural urban. It was important to, you know, have excellence in schools, and it was a real value that Kansan shared, Republican, Democrat, independent. I mean, people believe K through 12 education was really fundamentally the job of state government and something that they were willing to pay taxes to fund. That was um, critical. So um, we called them back and I, you know, had an outline of a bill, knew what they had put together, but the court wasn't shy about giving some <laughs> parameters, you know, how much money, how it had to be done, had to be power equalized, how much you could balance rich versus poor. And, um, you know, put together a coalition of, again, some moderate House members, some of whom paid the price of their legislative seats by participating in that, including Bill Kassebaum, Nancy's son, who was, you know, part of that coalition. But it was a really urgent need. And we could say, okay, we've got the Supreme Court on one hand, we've got schools that have to open in September, you want your kid to go back to school, or August. Um, we we have to come back this summer and get this done. And um, not easy, but um, again, I think people understood that there, but I think it was important to get their hometown constituents ready to roll. School board association, the folks at, at the local level, the parents uh, to understand this was a job that had to be done. Yeah. I think taking your, uh, I didn't want to call them problems, but the issues that impact people's lives directly out to people appears to be one of the hallmarks of your strategy and your, the way you work. And well, where did you learn to do that? I, I, you know, or did it, you just make it up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it always seemed to me to be sort of logical. I mean, my, my dad did some of that, you okay. know, with town halls and various things, but I think knowing that often what would happen here is legislators would vote a certain way and then I would read the hometown paper and realize that they were going home and saying, oh, I'm all for education, I'm all for this. So part of what I began to do, and I, I learned this even as in my trial lawyer days, is go to that hometown and say to people, you know what Dwayne is doing in Topeka? <laughs> He says he believes this, but here's how he's voting. And I, you know, in the trial lawyer days, I could do that with groups in the Bar Association. Yeah. I expanded that to insurance issues. They say they're for health insurance, and here's what they're voting on. So that the kind of informed inside-outside game. And I think one of the things a governor could do, and I should, could certainly do it as insurance commissioner, is get out of the Capitol. Yeah. I, I did not need to sit every day for the hearings and for the committee work. I could be out, legislators were captive prisoners here because that's the job they were committed to. I wasn't. I could go to their hometown and talk to their Rotary Club and their Optimus Club and the Chamber of Commerce and visit and talk about the issues that they were working on and inform constituents back home what it was that was coming up in the legislature. And that seemed to me to be a really important thing to do. Did you try that in Washington when you were HHS secretary? To some extent. We certainly went to places, it, it, not at election time, because you weren't really allowed to do that. You were, you know, we were sort of taken off the road as cabinet members. You weren't to participate in election. The Hatch Act prevented you from going to Joan Wagnon's district and saying, oh, never vote for her again. <laughs> but we could certainly go, I mean, it was done more on a positive sense. I spent a lot of my travel time going to places to highlight programs and leaders in various health areas. So you could shine a bright light, you could you know, put money in certain areas and then go say, this is why the money is there. So it was more kind of a, I wasn't the good cop, bad cop, I was the good cop. Yeah. Uh, most of the time um, in that role. I think one of the signature issues, if you can define something as a signature for Kathleen Sebelius, was your interest in health care. That was obvious. We were also interested in kids, but health care was something that you talked about from the first time I knew you and uh, throughout your whole legislative and political career. So. What were you able to accomplish in healthcare as a governor 
and what were you able to accomplish as the secretary of HHS? Because I always thought that's what pulled you <laughs> into Washington, even though you fought hard against going. Well, it's absolutely true that that's what pulled me into Washington. But um, I'd say as governor, you know, we, we were able to do some modest things. Um, not nearly as much as I would have liked. I tried to work when I was governor with then Insurance Commissioner Sandy Prager, a different party, but we'd been legislators together on expanding Medicaid, on you know looking at a variety of programs involving you know maternal births, uh, money to rural areas, uh, you know looking at, at various things we could do. Some of those were successful. We managed to set up a, a program that, you know, help pay um, medical school debt if you served in a rural area and had that actually paralleling the federal program. We were able to do some expansion of rural access issues and health care. Medicaid expansion was not something that people were interested in in any way, shape, or form. Um, so that was kind of frustrating. We did make some advances in health insurance, both when I was insurance commissioner and continued that. Mm -hmm. Um, along the way, but uh, you know, when I had the opportunity to work in the Obama administration as the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and, and it was really Health and Human Services, so not only did it have a president who came in committed to passing a health care bill, having watched the Clinton bill fail and he was committed to doing that. But it also had all the children and family issues. So it was really the sweet spot in my passion about policy because HHS had the Agency for Children and Families, all the adoption issues, all the foster care issues, Head Start, early Head Start, yeah. and all the health care, and all the senior care, and mental health. Um, so he, when he called me and said, um, I know you said you didn't want to be considered for a cabinet position because, as Dwayne said, the economy was going downhill and I'd asked about Thanksgiving time to be taken out of consideration and take my name off the list and um, and came back and said you know Tom Daschle is not has withdrawn his name um, would you serve in this position if I offered you this position I said yes I would <laughs> so that was the that was the sweet spot the sweet spot do you have other questions? We're, we're getting close to the end of time and when Kath, <laughs> Kathleen, time. the governor has to leave, but you, you wanted to I'll, ask a couple of things. I'll yeah. try a one minute question then. <laughs> I you never can, make a can. one minute answer, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, as governor, you had a pretty diverse cabinet uh, with Republicans. Uh, you had a former Republican governor, Mike Hayden, as uh, Secretary of Wildlife and Parks. You had a former Republican state chair as lieutenant governor for a period um, and others. How did that affect your governorship and your uh, how you did business and did it help you? Did it, uh, did it uh, make things easier or rougher or how, <laughs> how, how, how did that experience, how, how did you get to that point in the first place and then how did it play out? Well, I think that um, First of all, it was terrific, and um, I, I was really pleased that by the end of my service as governor, basically everybody I'd appointed, um, with the exception of Pam Betts, who wanted to retire early, was still there. So it, it was a cabinet that worked, but worked well together, and I thought served the state enormously well. I did have to do a lot of apologies to Mike Hayden, because as I said, I was a <laughs> young legislator who, was part of a coalition trying to make sure he was not reelected governor. I felt badly about that basically every day after that. And um, when I went to him and said, you know, I'd really love you to serve in this position and continue, he said, you know, it's, it's the best job I've ever had. Absolutely, I will do it. And I, I cannot tell you how much I've learned from Mike Hayden in that experience, not just about, you know, wildlife and parks, but he loves Kansas and he loved yeah. the outdoors and he taught me so much, including how to shoot a turkey. So I now have a turkey <laughs> in the Turkey Hall of Fame, you know, who knew? Um, but, uh, you know, the, my first lieutenant governor was a Republican businessman, John Correct. Moore, um, came out of Cessna. I knew John. 
when I was insurance commissioner, I had dealt with some issues around Cessna and, um, and I went to him and said, would you ever, con I knew his philosophy, I knew that he was pretty moderate, but I also thought it would be great to have somebody from the business community, somebody who had, he'd been you know, president of the Kansas Chamber, he had credentials that I clearly did not have and thought that would be a great balance. And he was a bit shocked when I asked him, but said, you know, I think, I think that, that might just work. <laughs> so in some ways it was Mark Parkinson, my second lieutenant governor, um, was even more curious. Um, I was actually recruiting Paul Morrison, uh, who I knew uh, as he was the Johnson County District Attorney. I'd worked with him on insurance issues, on sting operations, getting some bad agents out of the way. And I decided we needed a, an opponent for Phil Klein, right. the Attorney General. And I thought Paul Morrison, if he would switch parties, might be the perfect guy. He had this interesting background and record. And so I asked Paul to come meet me in a secret dark basement <laughs> room in Kansas City, <laughs> which he did, and he brought Mark Parkinson with him. And Mark had, I knew, because Mark and I served in the legislature sure. together. Mark was in the Senate when I was in the House. And I began to talk to Paul, and I finally said to Mark, what are you doing here? I mean, I really, <laughs> I was totally baffled. He said, Paul is my best friend. And if he's in, then I'm in. If he wants to do this, I'll do anything I can to help him. And he's willing to change parties, and I'm willing to change parties. And I said to Mark, don't change parties now. We need some. We need somebody to support Paul if he does this. Who's a Republican? So stay where you are. And then about four months later, as we were talking about Lieutenant Governor John was going to leave and go into full retirement as he had wanted to do four years earlier, and I said, Why don't we talk to him? You know, I remembered that conversation. He said, Well, I'd be willing to uh, switch parties. And I thought, Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> So I went to him and said, would you ever, you know, you want to help Paul? How about if you run with me? He said, okay. So um, that was the double dark secret that was not revealed to anybody until we announced it uh, in May or June. Um, but he, he was a terrific partner. I, he and I had worked on some issues together, mm -hmm. the Indian Compact issues, right. some other things. So I knew him. I knew that we would work well together. Um, but I think it, it did give me a balance. It gave me a, a way to you know, see issues from a broader perspective. They, had, they came out of geographic areas, John out of Wichita, Mark out of Johnson County that I didn't know. You know. Mike Hayden was Western Kansas. I mean, all broadened the perspective. I think gave some additional credibility um, to me if, you know, to, from their Republican friends. If they're willing to work with her, you know, we must be too. So it, I thought it worked really well. Any more questions? Um, I have lots more <laughs> questions, but I think we're, we're probably close, uh, close to uh, time here. Let me give you an opportunity to just sum up your experience as Kansas governor. Wow. Um, that's a hard, hard thing to do. I, I would say that there's no question being a legislator made me a much better governor mm -hmm. uh, because I knew how the legislature worked. I knew what people needed and wanted. It, it made me um, much more able to, you know, kind of put the coalitions together, build a program, identify policies where people would come together. And no question being a governor made me a much better secretary. I felt very sorry for some of my colleagues who either came out of a congressional office or someplace else and ended up in the cabinet because they did not know the agency rhythm. You know, I had had um, a cabinet and HHS had 11 operating agencies, very similar to a cabinet, yeah. you know, with really talented people running each of those agencies. I dealt with that before. Um, I knew how to work a bit with the congressional um, issues and work on those budgets. Um, what was a real surprise to me when I got to be a cabinet member was I had a boss again. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't had a boss in a really long, not in the legislature, not we, in the insurance we, we office, not that. as governor. Uh -huh. I had no boss. So 
That was a shock, but yeah. um, it, each step along the way, I think, really served me well. And ironically, one of the things I think that happened as secretary and one of the traits, and I would not have ever picked it out of the puzzle, was as an insurance regulator, I had regulated the private insurance market. There was nobody in government who did that. They ran Medicare and Medicaid, yeah. but not until the Affordable Care Act was passed did they have any programs in the private market that were actually regulated at the state level. I knew how to do that. I had done that, and it ironically, so each piece of the puzzle really served me enormously well. So what's next, Kathleen? And forgive me for calling you Kathleen. But oh, what else would you call too me? Many That's years. my name. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love what I'm doing now. I portfolio of got some interesting boards on the commercial side, some policy issues that I'm still involved in. It won't come as any surprise. They still involve health care. I have four beautiful grandchildren. I have um, I play pickleball most days and still run. And so my life is is a great balance of interesting activities, and I get to say no to a whole lot of things that I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> let me uh, and Duane thank you for Thanks. your service to the state of Kansas, to our community, and to the nation. Thank um, you. I noticed somewhere in all this stuff that I looked at that you are now named by Forbes magazine as one of the 100 most powerful women in the country. Does that make you feel powerful? No. Or does it? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to tell the people who live in my house that that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You bet. Yes. Thank you. It was fun working with you, for you, and... Uh, with me. With, with you. <laughs> yes. Happily. This was fun. It was. Okay, we need to look at the camera and... Uh, <laughs> All right.